Katja Kroll is the Minister of State, the German Federal Foreign Office. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. It's good to have you here. You know, when we were talking about you coming this morning, we uh, were trying to figure out how to pronounce your name, especially the second name. The first name is K-A-T-J-A. That's uh, Katya. It's Katya. Mm -hmm. Second name is K-E-U-L. It's Coil. Coil. It would be like an O and an I in English. So E-U yeah. is O-I. <laughs> okay. All right. Katya Coil. Welcome to Kenya. How long have you been there in the country? Well, I arrived uh, the day before yesterday at night. So I have two days and this is my second day and I'm leaving again tonight okay. uh, back to Berlin. We saw that you, you had some meetings with uh, members of parliament yesterday. You've met other people as well. What brings you to Kenya? Well, uh, I'm uh, representing the foreign minister of the Federal Republic of Germany. And uh, we want to show that um, we are really meaning serious that we want to intensify our relationship with our Afri African partners, especially with Kenya, because Kenya is really an important partner for us. Um, we see that the war came back to Europe, which is a terrible situation, but we also see there is war in this region, and we are all living in one world, so we cannot solve our problem one each other. We have to do it together, and we want to cooperate with Kenya on all these peace and security issues mm. uh, and especially all around your country we have Somalia we have the conflict in Ethiopia we have uh, Congo um, so I've been talking to uh, to your government to the executive but also to the parliament parliamentarians and also to the chief justice to the judiciary so it was a, a very uh, intensive day yesterday and mm. I got a I, I got an impression on how it, the dynamic works in Kenya and how much uh, chances and, and opportunities uh, there is if we really intensify our cooperation. Mm. Just so as everybody can understand the structure of offices in Germany, your Minister of State, German Federal Foreign Office, what does that mean? Are you the Minister for Foreign Affairs? Are you the Assistant Minister? Or are you a, a PS? What is that? I'm a deputy foreign minister. Uh, I'm representing the, my, my minister is Annalena Baerbock. She is the first female, female foreign minister of Germany. And she has three deputies. And I'm one of them. She has three state ministers. And I'm the state minister for Africa. Right. So a state minister is a deputy? So if you want to. It's so, like yes. an assistant minister. Yeah. Or PSs as well. Mm. Yeah. So when you say there are three of you, so, okay, like in this ministry, you are in charge of the continent of Africa. Yes. Okay. What about the other two? What are they in charge of? Well, the other one, one is the, the European state minister. So she's doing all the, the conferences in Brussels and uh, among the Europeans. And Europeans have a lot of uh, internal conferences. So mm -hmm. that's what she's covering up. And then the other colleague is kind of doing the rest of the world, the transatlantic relations, NATO security issues uh, and besides Africa I'm also responsible for cultural exchange foreign cultural policy um, so this is also a, a kind of a wide field uh, uh, so we are uh, supporting students exchange exchange of scientists uh, uh, we have all our German institutions that we support that are also here in Kenya and Nairobi mm -hmm. the Goethe Institute the DAAD so all these institutions are um, uh, are supported by the foreign uh, foreign uh, office. Uh, yeah. Okay. Is the state minister a member of parliament? Yes, indeed. That's kind of a, a little bit special. Uh, even our ministers, uh, they stay members of parliament when they enter in executive. So I've been a member of parliament for over twelve years, thirteen years now. So three periods. It's four four years is our. Uh, periods in Germany so it's uh, I've been uh, in the opposition for 12 years and since one year um, we're part of the government so that's how th it's only 11 months now mm. that I'm state minister for Africa are, are there any ministers or deputy ministers who are not members of parliament uh, yes there can be ministers that are not in parliament um, if the the chancellor decides to uh, ask them some, some expert from outside the parliament to be minister that happens mm. once in a while but 
usually most of them are parliamentarians. What would you say is the German government's policy on the continent of Africa? If you were to talk about it broadly, what is the foreign policy? What is it about? What is it that it speaks to? Well, as I said, we, we really focus on intensifying that partnership because our continents are neighbors. And what uh, inflicts Africa also touches Europe and the other way around. So there is the question of climate change, climate protection, energy. So there is a lot of opportunity there to cooperate, especially uh, with Kenya, but also with other countries um, to see, well, we have worldwide, we have to change the way we produce uh, energy mm. uh, if we want to reach the, the goals of, of, of Paris uh, of, uh, of 1.5 percent. And um, so there's opportunities there because a lot of times we have the technology and then African countries have the infra infrastructure or the sun, shine, the wind. The, I mean, Kenya is, is uh, really top number one There's when it comes to renewable energy. Sure, yeah. You have 90% of your electricity made by renewable energy. This is far more than, than we have in Germany. We have about a little bit more than 50% now. So that's, this is where we, where we work on. And then this, the, the, the second focus, of course, is peace and security. And we are very troubled by what happens in Europe. We've never thought that war would come back to Europe. And uh, we, uh, we want this war to end as soon as possible. But unfortunately, we have one side that decided to go for military solution, bombing their neighbor country. Uh, and we see very clearly that it's, well, the, ma the, the, the people that are suffering the most, of course, is the Ukrainian people. But of course, also our people, they're very worried. They don't know how to pay their gas bills. We have inflation. We have economic problems as well. And then we see very clearly that there's African countries that are suffering the most because of the nutrition crisis, because of the drought. Uh, it's the Sahel. It's here. It's the region uh, of the east of Africa that is really, really suffering from all these consequences. So we want to make clear that we keep up uh, all our humanitarian aid. We're not cutting down because of the war in Europe because mm. we see that this is just necessary. It's, it, otherwise, it would destabilize um, the whole region and, and we are all linked to each other. So that's, that's the, the focus. And let's, politically speaking, uh, we see the need that, that we defend our common values together. The values written down in the United Nations Charta, written down in the Charta of the African Union, the respect of borders. Um, so we are, if we let it happen that aggressors uh, just, you know, get their will, then we are all in trouble. So yeah. we need each other to mm. defend the, the rule-based international order. You know, it brings into mind a question of policy again, but now policy on immigration, because with the war in Ukraine, yes, there's movement, probably un unprecedented in a very, very long time. But it isn't just the Europeans who move. People from the African continent have been moving to Europe. Now, the, the CDU government under Angela Merkel uh, had what I as an African would consider a very lenient approach towards immigration. Now, the party you belong to and this government, what are your policies on immigration? Well, we, uh, my party, I'm a member of the Green Party, and mm. we always wanted a liberal immigration uh, uh, law, and we were one of the first ones to say Germany is an immigration country. For a long time, people didn't want to realize it in Germany that that is the case. But I think by now this is kind of a common sense that, that uh, we, we are an immigration country and we need immigration too. So, of course, we need to find procedures uh, that we we still struggle on politically, but we are moving ahead. And this is also an opportunity of our cooperation. If we find a way to, to come together, um, the African countries have all the use that we don't have. Your young countries, a lot of young motivated mm -hmm. people, qualified people, and, uh, and we are an old country. We are overaged. Our companies, they have... 
they have technology and everything, but they need people. So if we kind of ca can come together, then we'll have a win-win situation. Mm. So this is kind of the, the vision of the future where we still have to find ways how to, how to organize it so that it's working for everybody. And of course, we have refugees like you have refugees. I mean, it's, uh, we really appreciate what Kenya is doing for the refugees of, of your neighboring countries. Yeah, you are yeah. taking lots of them. And uh, we have Ukrainian refugees right now, too. It's about a million. Most of them really stay close to the border because they want to go back as soon as it's possible. Most of them are not coming to stay. But of course, we have other refugees from other countries where they can't co come back. So our policy is if they're there and they want to integrate, that we need to give them the chance to integrate. Honorable Mr. It's really a pleasure, pleasure to have you on board today. And uh, I think I really am glad for the interrelations that, you know, Kenya and, 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 and Germany have. I mean, your local ambassador here, uh, Sebastian, speaks, you know, good Swahili. Uh, my wife speaks fluent German as well. So there's a, a very strong relations culturally or on that aspect. Uh, seeing you here and talking about climate change is an excitement about COP27. And you mentioned about, you know, uh, Apart from being in Kenya, you're going to be in Namibia, you're going to be in South Africa. So a really keen focus on Africa. What are your sentiments with the uh, climate change conference happening in Egypt for the first time in Africa as well? And uh, perhaps as a government, what will you be putting forward? Well, our government will be there, our chancellor, my foreign minister, and uh, everybody's really preparing for it because we don't have much time to lose. And what, what we as a government are trying to promote is that we really look into funding adapt adaptation to climate change because obviously when we look in this part of the world climate change uh, is here to stay it's not a crisis that comes and goes so we have really to look into long-term financing for adaptation and also for loss and damages and that's also something that the Kenya government uh, wants to to do so we are standing by your side and uh, I talked to the uh, security advisor of the president mm -hmm. yesterday and that's that she made it very clear that this is where we need to go okay. and that we need um, to start right when the conference is over. The projects need to start because we cannot lose time. Mm. Let me talk about the business relation, Eric, if you allow, just yeah. on the beat about the... Uh, there's a whole conversation about the German Kenya. So we spoke about culturally, so about climate change. And now touch on the, the the business relationships, you know, and what can we actually create and enhance. Um, I, I mean, we've had touch points, you know, for instance, flown on Lufthansa, for instance, you know, I really enjoyed the service out there. There are lots of uh, German brands that are in Kenya are termed quality. You know, they're German brands that perhaps, you know, you drive and say, you know what, these are actually quality brands that you actually do. Apart from, you know, um, and that I think mechanical engineering, which is largely known to be top of the league, what are the areas of, you know, business partnership and ties are you, are you creating with, with Kenya today? Well, what I can talk about uh, okay. is what Africa I already well said about there. the yeah. about especially the, the technology for, yeah. for, for energy, for renewable energy. I see yeah. a, a really high potential there and high okay. interest uh, from the German companies. Um, and, they're, and, and you have really extremely good um, uh, experience with uh, the, 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 the geothermic uh, mm -hmm. technology. So mm -hmm. this is uh, very interesting for us. Great. When you talk about that, uh, the technology transfer, it, it sounds to me, uh, and we've had these conversations many times on this show before, when we look at the West versus Africa, when it comes to energy and moving towards clean energy and renewable energy, Africa does not need to move towards clean energy. Africa is in clean energy. It's your country and the others that need to move towards clean energy. But then you hold a technology for clean energy, you hold a patent for the technology for clean energy. And when you come to Africa and you tell us, you know, avoid going fossil routes, go clean, but you hold a patent for that. And then you also know that we have a lot of uh, minerals. We have oil that we've discovered. Uganda, natural resources. natural resources. Uganda has that. We've got coal. The projects in like Kenya attempted to go into a coal project for just a thousand megawatts using coal compared to how much coal Germany uses, um, how, how much energy Germany produces through coal. But then we see the conversation is, no, 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 you should not go that route. You should go clean energy. 
but you're not getting the technology for clean energy. How do you balance that? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, the ones that caused uh, climate change uh, are the industrial states. We did a lot more to cause the problem and other countries are, are suffering from the consequences even though they they didn't they are not taking uh, had a big part in it so i understand the point and it's not up to us to say well you know don't do this or don't do that um, uh, so and, and especially now with the world crisis on gas uh, we understand that there's African countries saying, well, we want to exploit our resources just like you Europeans exploited yours. But on the other side, I mean, we all have to see that the fact is we're living in one world. And so we should really try not to repeat mistakes that we have done in the past because, I mean, the especially the countries that have the resources that they want to exploit are also the same ones that suffer from the consequences from climate change the most. So... So we are in the same boat and we need to try to work together to find a way to, to come up to the, to the uh, absolutely right interests of the countries to say, well, we want to provide our people with electricity, absolutely. So, um, and that's, that's also the reason why in, in, in the COP conference and the oncoming, mm -hmm. we say, well, we need to provide the funding for the adaptation to climate change. That's our responsibility also as the ones that caused the problem but i i would just you know try to to say it's it's not a question of justice mm. to do the same mistakes we made because then we we are we, we are not getting ahead so but but but, but honorable Kaji, let me just push back on that yeah. look it's not that there's injustice in the conversation it's clear i mean we should all try and avoid using fossil fuels and the ones that caused the problems that we are seeing but the pushback comes from those activists who say germany for example it's not talking about stopping to use fossil fuels tomorrow it's talking about gradual reduction of fossil fuel and gradual adaptation of green energy the same thing that african countries are saying we have renewable energy and we're just saying let's mix as we get into accelerating our use of and the use of uh, renewable energies, can we exploit the resources that we have and just have a mix that maybe brings us to 20%? 20% will still be less than 1% of what German will be using at that point with the dirty energy. So the, the conversation when he says, you know, let's not go into, you know, doing the kind of things that we did, but you are continuing to do the kind of things that you did. Where is the justice in that? <laughs> <laughs> uh. No, we are not saying don't don't do this or don't do that. So th it's clear there's going to be a mix. There's going to be a mix uh, for a certain time of fossil energy and renewable energy, as well in the south as well as in in Europe. So I think I think we are all trying our best to uh, to come up to to the goals of of Paris. Um, everybody's trying what, what they can and we need to support each other. There, it's not, not of, uh, you know, asking African countries not to use their, their resources, but we need to, to do as much as we can to get as fast as we can into the renewable energy. And I mean, your country is the best example for it. So, so we want to, we can also, you know, learn from you because that's a, you're, you're, you already went further than, than we, are, we did. So we will have a certain time and the times is even more difficult because of the war, because everybody's trying, well, we are trying to, to become independent of Russian gas. So we have to do two things at the same time right now, which really makes it complicated because we're in, in office now for just a year. We started in December and our program was, well, let's get, let's invest in renewable. And there was a lot of mistakes made in the last 20 years. We lost a lot of time in Germany uh, uh, to, to, to work on really, you know, getting cleaner in our energy. So we started, we were motivated. We started in December and said, okay, now we're going to really get into renewable and we'll do it better than we used to. And then with the war now, we have the problem that at the same time we need to get out of, of, of the, the dependency of, of Russian gas, mm. which of course makes this whole thing even more dynamic and more complicated. So I, 
I absolutely understand it's complicated for other countries as well, yeah. for everybody. So uh, it's it's the economy in Germany as well that ha is in, in deep trouble because what, what we're doing right now in Germany has never been done before. Uh, and people are very, very worried mm -hmm. and, and companies don't know how to, to continue to exist actually with, with what's happening on the gas market. So we are all in trouble and I think we are all doing, trying to do our best. The best you can. Yeah. Is there yes. any kind of uh, pressure being applied by the citizens and the industries in Germany towards the resolution of the conflict in Ukraine? What is your government being told by the people of Germany? What needs to Happen? What does Germany need to do to see a resolution to the situation in Ukraine? Well, the the, res the the resolution would be to if this bombing would stop. That would be <laughs> that would be the point where everybody would be happy to see people come back to the table because this is where you solve problems and not by by bombing civil population. And so far, there is there is a, a huge solidarity by the German people towards uh, the U to support the, the Ukrainian uh, people. There is a big support. But of course, as we come, the winter is coming and the economy problem are getting worse and people don't know how to pay for their heating, there, the ten there's tension coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, that's clear. So this is our political task, really, to, to keep our society together and say, we're going to go through this together. Um, we don't uh, see uh, an option as Germany or Europe to enter into in this conflict or, or tell the Ukrainian people, you know, this is now, this is, you know, s stop defending you yourself, give just up now. give up your territory because, you know, German people don't like the problems uh, that uh, mm -hmm. roll from it. It's, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not. It's not nothing we can do because they're a sovereign country and they're they have the right to self-defense. So we we are we are standing there. We are ready if as soon as there is this this opportunity to to be part or to help you know bring people to to the table. But as long as one side is refusing any other solution than the military one, I I. I doubt that we'll f see a very, very quick solution. Um, all we can do is keep on supporting the Ukrainian self-defense, but it's going to be a hard time for everybody, also for the German people. From your position as uh, the German government, how can we as a continent of Africa help you? Because you clearly need help. Oh, you can be of a, of a huge help when it comes to the solidarity in the international community, like in the United uh, Nations uh, General Assembly, to make clear that we stand together and we are not going to accept um, the military aggressors um, uh, hurting other people, the borders and, and bombing their neighbor countries. To say we, we don't accept it, it's unacceptable. We want to see the respect for sovereign countries, for borders, and, and this would be a big help politically to make clear, to isolate the aggressor and say the whole world is not accepting what you're doing. Uh, it, it doesn't sound like as effective as sending weapons or uh, military equipment, but it is a very, very important factor to have this political solidarity among the international community. But is Europe willing to treat Africa as equal partners, are they willing economically and financially to have policies that are not as exploitative as other governments within the West have had towards this continent? Because part of the reason why you will find political leaders on this continent either vacillate or lean towards whichever side suits their purpose is because of the feeling that they have not always been treated fairly or as equal partners. Absolutely, that's what I hear in, in many of my uh, meetings with uh, African governments telling me exactly that. And it's right. Um, it's not always African partners have not always been treated uh, as they, they should have been treated. Um, but I can only speak for for now and for our government and that's what we really want to change we want to 
to have partners uh, on on the same level uh, because we we need each other. So it's uh, it's it it's not that we are just coming and saying, well, we're we're giving you humanitarian aid and then we're we're gone. The, mm. um, we are there now, and and the amount of humanitarian aid, really, to 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 make it clear, we are still as Germany, we are the second biggest donor of humanitarian aid for Somalia, or for Ethiopia, or for the region here, and it's we also all also have to explain this as politicians to our own people when yep. they get in need. Mm. That that's what we what we think we have to do. We say we cannot cut on the humanitarian aid now because. This is destabilizing. This is a danger to everybody, to the people in East Africa, but also for the rest of the world. If the drought and the the, the famine uh, leads to more war, then we are all in it. So, let me ask you a thorny question. You are the person within the government who is in charge of this continent. Now, the German presence as a colonial power in Africa wasn't as vast as the British or the French, but they were there. Now, the thing that Tanzania, people mention it in passing, but Namibia is never mentioned without a certain note of concern. Now, if we're talking about peace and we're talking about fair treatment, the government that you now serve in, what are the reparations that they have well planned to put in place or follow through from what the previous government did, given the history that Germany has with Namibia? Absolutely. This is a very important issue, and I, and I sort of made it to a, a personal priority of mine. So I went to Tanzania. That was one of the first countries I went to. I just came back from Cameroon, uh, going to Namibia. And um, there is there's something growing as a growing interest also in the civil society in Germany to know more about this this time of colonialism because for some reasons we actually realize we don't know much about it mm. we have been very our history has always been kind of difficult but you know we we tried to really get into it and 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 work on 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 what happened but for the colonial time in africa it's like it's like a, a, a black book yet, mm -hmm. so we haven't really looked into it. It's called denial. Yeah, it's been denial for, for many years, and it's just now really, you know, this, this, this need is coming up. And mm -hmm. talking to, to the African partners, we see they also, they, they, have, they say, well, there is some, some pages have been destroyed in our book, and we want to, to <laughs> close so the gap, and we need you to work with us together Great, to close yeah. it. So that there is a, an opportunity if we can manage to work on it together then we we heal the wounds and we work for for a better future as well so there is a lot to do and we have a lot of like cultural objects that are still in museums in germany mm -hmm. that that we are willing to return and the museums are willing to return them so now there's a lot of cooperation between the museums to try to find out how to return them to whom what do they mean? What do we do with these cultural objects? So, and that cooperation is coming on really strong. So like for Tanzania, it's clear there's going to be, there is an exhibition in Berlin, in Germany, with those cultural objects where each object that's presented is cleared first with the community where it comes from mm. to say how is this going to be presented. And then in 24, this exhibition will move to Tanzania and the objects will move as well. Mm -hmm. And then they stay there and they'll be uh, the property of the state of, of Tanzania. Mm -hmm. So these things are really coming on strong. And I, in Cameroon, um, I, I, just, uh, I was there for two days and um, I worked on the case of the King Mangabel that was uh, killed executed by the German colonial authorities mm. and uh, it there was a big need and so I went there and we had a common uh, commemoration ceremony with the family of the the kings and I explained as a representative of the German government that it, it was injustice and that uh, it, it should never have happened so there was th they 
and they really appreciated it and I appreciate it as a way for me it was an honor to be able to be invited by them to commemorate this war crime that mm. actually happened so and this is kind of the start of a process it's not the end of a process it's the start of a process to look into the part to look into the archives yeah. together in the archives in Africa but the archives in Berlin and try to get the information out of it mm. and um and heal the wounds of the past. So there's a lot to do. Great. Uh, Honorable Minister, I think uh, you've really touched on uh, very key points that are actually top or on the radar of various governments across the world. I mean, I think we're calling this the pandemic period, you know, talking about climate change, talking about the food crisis, the, the Ukraine war. How um, is the German government helping, especially continents like Africa, to actually build, um, what can I say, build resilience? to, you know, I mean, you mentioned about the war, but, you know, it's been um, written that, you know, even the, or the impact on the grain supply into Africa is really dwindling out of that, um, you know, uh, issue that's happening, you know, it might, it might be deemed far away. But how can we talk about building, it might not be just be African continent, but just across your other partners as well, building resilience to actually, you know, um, you know, fight off some of these effects of the war, fight off effects of the COVID pandemic, for instance, fight off effects of climate change, um, and and what what would be required of governments? Well, for for the COVID, um, we had, as you know, we had a German company developing mm -hmm. the the vaccination, mm -hmm. and there is the we are trying right now to support the production of vaccines. In, Germ in Africa. So President Steinmeier went to Senegal in February to, to open up, a, and I think in Rwanda, mm -hmm. and so to, to, to really have the, the vaccines on, on board okay. where, they, yeah. where they are needed. Um, and of course, for agriculture, that's, that's one of the main questions. How, how can, this is a question of adaptation to climate change. Mm. This is what we talked before. How can we find new ways or support new ways to have a better resilience in the agricultural uh, sector? This is also feedback on the East African community. I think we've seen a lot of work also what the GIZ is doing as well. We're just supporting that uh, regional integration so that you know, countries can also work together. So mm -hmm. you're not just dealing par country, you're also having a regional focus mm -hmm. on Twitter. I think that's hats off to, to, to your government for that. As you conclude the conversation, Honorable Minister, the, your, your president visited the country a couple of years ago. And one of the things that uh, he and his counterpart here then, President Uhuru Kenyatta, were focusing on is support for Tibets, the technical education. Mm -hmm. There is a program that they went to launch at Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology where the German government was going to come and support in the upgrading of facilities at Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology to become like a knowledge hub for, for Tibet education in Kenya. How far is that project? Well, I can't tell you any details on it, but at least last yesterday when I was in Parliament, I, I met one of the parliamentarians that went through the program. Okay. So obviously... The, it is impact. it is working it is on board mm -hmm. and i can really say that this is something we are proud of because this is a special specialty we have in germany is the the professional uh ed degrees that we get without going for the academic not going to university or college but having a, a professional degree is what makes german workers also famous because they are very good trained and and uh, so and, and we are in need in Germany because, as I said, we have less and less young people. So the the professional schools, they have trouble filling their their classes for these kind of 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 jobs because a lot of people just, you know, prefer going to to university. So we are really interested in in promoting this this good idea that's been working so good for us for so many years. And I'm sure it can also work for Kenya very good. For those of us who uh, want to know what she's referring to, I think uh, uh, that was yesterday, of course, on our visit, um, visiting uh, the parliament, several parliamentarians. That's on page 14 
uh, of uh, of the standard and we have your picture of your honorable minister as well with a few of uh, uh, our, our MPs so mm -hmm. I think that I mean Tibet is really uh, something that people really need to actually embrace it's and, I, and I think also for us as a standard group we really try to really talk about the Tibet uh, institutions and really how do we improve our skill sets so it doesn't matter you, you don't have to have gone to university but technical institutions are what you actually need to actually go into and and, and practice and learning a lot from um, the, the, the German government and how it's how it's been done there so I think for me it the opportunity to actually push the Tibet agenda because mm. Um, here, I think, City Eric, we always just talk about universities. I think that you will only have made it if you go to university. But I think right now there's going to be something that, you know, the Tibet Big focus on Tibet. Yeah. Honorable Minister, thank you very much for joining us. We understand you have another meeting that you're heading into, and we appreciate that you joined us this morning for this conversation and everything else that you're doing. Uh, you'll be flying out of the country tonight. Where yes. to next? Berlin, well, it? next week is the session week of the parliament okay. in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So on Monday morning, I'll be back uh, in parliament. Okay. Katja Coyle is the Minister of State for German Federal Office. Minister of State, of State in charge of Africa. She's basically like the assistant minister whose focus is primarily Africa. She's been here with us. She's visiting the country, living. She's been on a tour of African countries uh, just to get to understand and see how to deep in the cooperation between the two countries. Your final message to the audience listening to you in Kenya and abroad? Well, we stand by your side and we are only strong if we stand together and then we can solve the problems of the future. Indeed.